presentation of TFNN. The Tom O'Brien Show is produced every business day. Tom takes your phone calls toll-free at 1-877-927-6648. Internationally at 727-873-7618. Let's go to uh, Phil in Puerto Rico. Hey, Phil, what's going on? Hey, Tom, doing great. Um, just wanted to thank you guys and the whole crew. Best content on the internet. Really appreciate everything you guys are doing. We appreciate you growling and prowling with us out here. Phil, how did you find us? I just typed in live trading and YouTube one morning. Cool. I was looking for any type of live trading room you guys came up in. The, awesome. I know the quality when I see it, or at least I like to think so. And uh, I mean, you guys are just a dream. I appreciate everything well, you guys do. Welcome to the Target family. We appreciate your growling uh, problem with us. Uh, my pleasure. Now, Tom O'Brien. <laughs> Welcome, folks. This is the Tom O'Brien Show, and I am Jacob, filling in for Tom. He'll be back Monday. Everything today is red. We have the DIA down, NDX, the Q's down, gold is down. The thing we have up right now is the dollar. And so we're just past that 102 mark. Um, moving on here real quick. So we'll see if we can get back up to this 105 area and see if 106 is in play for the dollar. Um, but uh, this guy has been rallying quite a bit. It's been pushing up. It's been having this real tough resistance since uh, about March, end of March, beginning of April, getting over that 102 hump. It did today. Nice big bar up. Um, so we'll see what happens. Obviously, uh, Tom was talking about it on Twitter today. Someone asked a question um, with the DX, with the dollar running higher, what does that mean for us in the market? particularly gold. So usually these guys have an inverse relationship. Um, so we might see a quick retrace of gold down to some level. Um, the GDX obviously is down 0.22% right now. Um, but we'll wait and see. We'll wait and see what the dollar does. Uh, today, um, one of the things I wanted to talk about, the thing that is not red, is First Solar. So First Solar makes uh, solar panels, essentially, and they just uh, acquired a company called Eveler AB, which is a Swedish company. They uh, make the film that goes over uh, solar panels. So this has been huge. Uh, as you can see, this, this jumped up 25% just today. Uh, we were trading at what, like around 180 before this news came out. Um, obviously a huge jump. You can see it kind of retested this level um, the last day with volume from March 1st. Uh, just briefly dipped under it, and then we came back up. Um, obviously, this major volume was on uh, some news that's outside of the technical with it. But um, you can see it did retest that level last day with volume, and it crept up. And it did that as well on the day. Okay. Still there? I can, my mouse is no longer working. Hmm. There we go. I love that. Anyways, if we look, if we go to a yearly on it, have the next, let's see, it tested this level again, right here, uh, broke down briefly and then popped back up, this time with no volume, so we could probably assume that's in some way what it was going to do prior to this news, but anyways, this got big, I think the calls on it right now are like at 12.50, um, expiring next week, which is pretty massive, uh, so the market still sees an upside in this stock, even though it just busted through 25%, obviously busted through massive resistance. Um, so give a little bit more on it. Uh, clear resistance around 220 and regained its 50-day moving average uh, since April. The stock far extended from uh, prior breakout uh, past the buy point of 185.38. Um, it was the best performer, obviously, in the SPX today. Uh, pretty, pretty intense. Um, it's on track for its highest close since September 19, 2008. Um, and then really, solar stock in general has popped up today on this news. We look at Ray. Uh, let's see here. Ray's up 15%. This kind of is what happens, right? Like, you get a big bust out in the market with one company and the whole, the rest, everyone wants to get exposure. Maybe they don't want it in that stock. I mean, is that is that really like a long-term thing? Ray hasn't done anything differently. And I'm currently, and I looked, I'm currently not aware of anything larger in the solar market that would drive a uh, like a, a sector-wide increase like this. Uh, we can look at Next Tracker as well, it's NXT. 
That popped up again pretty similarly, 10%. And then we have Shoals. And that was up 4%, modestly at least. But these are kind of the big ones, at least in solar. If you're looking for any kind of exposure in solar, I would take a look at these. Again, that's Array, which is A-R-R-Y, Next Tracker, NXT, and then Shoal Technologies. Um, but we'll see if that lasts, at least in the market as a whole. I'm, I'm sure First Solar will probably still has a little bit to go up. Um, but again, if we look at kind of what it tends to do, which again, of course, past performance isn't indicative of a uh, future performance, but um, still, we might see a, a little retrace in there sometime next week. Interesting nonetheless. Another big news story we have is Tesla. They're having a recall of 1.1 million of uh, other vehicles in China. Uh, there was something to do with brakes. Uh, they weren't they weren't working properly, and this is this has been an issue actually even in America for quite a while. It just it seemed like it wasn't. Uh, so spread across the, uh, or excuse me, it wasn't so like, uh, I guess specified in just a batch like it was in China, right? I mean, you had stories of um, people in California getting pinned against walls because of the breaks. Um, obviously in China, they found this out, I think before anything too intense happened. Everyone's like, okay, is this negative for the stock? Obviously this, this stock is pretty sensitive to news, I feel like. And what I mean like that is you'll get a small sell off, right? I think people look for reasons to try to play with this thing, but then it does kind of tend to rebound again and you, and you get its power. Um, I think what's interesting is the way that they're going to deal with this recall is they're going to do over the air software fix, which is, in my opinion, if that goes flawlessly is actually a major bonus for Tesla to show that they can actually do this. Um, and Nothing insane needs to happen, and maybe in the future uh, the, the vehicles themselves don't even need to be fully recalled if the issue um, you know, isn't something so intense as, as brakes. Um, so the cars started notifying drivers when they pressed the accelerator for an extended period. Um, Tesla sold 1.13 million cars in China from 2014 through March 2023. Um, the acceleration issue has been a constant issue, but they've been able to kind of fix it a little bit, again, with these over-the-air updates, which I think for everything that you can criticize, this kind of hyper-connectivity of the world and everything being online and the Internet of Things and so on, that is a, that is a pretty cool uh, component, right? Like, you can just get an update on your car. Um, again, there's implications to that in general, but I think that's kind of a neat thing. Um, what's interesting, at least in the production in China, uh, they have an EV factory in Shanghai, and uh, that has produced 711,000 cars just last year alone. And so that's more than half of the output that they have worldwide. And it just shows you how, in I think, you know, obviously big Tesla um, exposure is in China. Um, and I think if they nail this properly and it doesn't affect the Chinese buyer too much, this uh, this recall, um, I think this, they're they're poised for uh, another increase. We'll get back a little bit too. He's leaving uh, the CEO position of Twitter, and in my opinion, I think that's also another positive thing for Tesla as well. Folks, stay tuned. We will be right back. Currencies, commodities, and bond markets are as important as ever right now with how they're driving the volatility in equity markets across the globe, which is why it's a great time to try out Teddy Kegstat's Tiger Forex Report. Teddy Kegstat breaks down the Forex markets every Monday using his 30-plus years of experience as a trading veteran of futures, Forex, stocks, and options. Teddy releases his weekly Tiger Forex Report every Monday morning with coverage of all the major currency pairs, including the dollar index, the euro dollar, pound dollar, dollar Swiss, dollar yen as well as many more and he also has weekly coverage of the crude oil market and the 30-year t-bonds as they both influence forex markets tremendously when you sign up for the tiger forex report you also gain instant access to teddy's 60-minute webinar archive he just hosted forex strategies and fundamentals what is behind the tiger forex report for all the details and to start your 30-day tiger forex report subscription today visit the front page of tfnn.com tfnn educating investors are you looking for a way to consistently add winning trades to your portfolio? Tom O'Brien is here to help. Tom O'Brien has been successfully trading markets for over 30 years. 
A frequent contributor to TD Ameritrade Network and CNBC, Tom O'Brien founded TFNN over 20 years ago to help educate investors just like you. Tom's daily market newsletter, Market Insights, is published every morning when the markets open to give you the competitive informational edge you need to succeed. These newsletters are packed full of Tom's advanced technical analysis and are geared to deliver comprehensive strategies for a successful portfolio. Get Tom O'Brien's newsletter, Market Insights, today and try all of our products and newsletters 30 days risk-free with our money-back guarantee at TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at TFNN.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years experience experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com. Educating investors. Call now, toll free at 1-877-927-6648. Internationally at 727-873-7618. Welcome back, folks. So one of the big things that's going on in the news is the U.S. debt ceiling issues that we're having. Uh, Yellen went on Bloomberg today. And she said if the debt ceiling negotiations fall through, that the U.S. will have to default on something, whether that's treasuries or Social Security payments. It's pretty big. The U.S. has not defaulted on anything um, beginning in 1789. There's a whole history behind this, starting with the Revolutionary War and then and the, the loans that they got. And they came up with a pretty novel idea. And this is where we started to look at debt much more like an asset. That's due to Alexander Hamilton. It's a pretty fascinating story. If you don't know it, I would recommend looking it up. But what we can see here, and when this started first getting into the news cycle, it seems like you know every other year or whatever, you'd always hear that there's issues, uh, we're not gonna raise it, or there's some kind of impasse that's going on, and this seems, for whatever reason, this year to be a bit more intense. So one of the stories they have here is US debts, the U.S. debt ceiling impasse pushes government credit default swaps to record highs. The cost of ensuring exposure to U.S. government debt rose to fresh highs on Wednesday as the president and top lawmakers remain deadlocked in talks. And again, still nothing came out um, from today. Uh, over raising 31.4 trillion, uh, raising the 31.4 trillion federal borrowing limit. And folks, it's really important, at least in the way that our current economy works, that we do not default on this. That can really, well, I'll pull up something from the Committee of Responsible Federal Budget in a little bit that talks more about this. Uh, but the damage that would do to the trust of the nation, um, at least in the financial component of it, would be pretty intense. So spreads on US one-year credit default swaps uh, marked based gauges of the risk of default. Uh, they widened to 172 basis points, which is an all-time high according to the global market intelligence data. And that's up from a close of 163 on Tuesday. The cost of insuring U.S. debt against default for five years stood at 73 basis points, up from 72 basis points on Tuesday, and that's touching the highest level since 2009. Uh, again, as it says here, this protracted legislative fight We'll see what happens regarding it. Um, as of last week, the spreads on one-year CDs implied a 3.9% probability that the U.S. would default. Um, and that was lower than the probability during the 2011 debt ceiling crisis. Uh, again, another protracted legislative standoff prompted uh, S&Ps to downgrade the U.S. credit rating for the first time. Um, if we look over here, again, this is from that, uh, excuse me, 
the organization I was talking about, the Committee for uh, Responsible Federal Budget. So we can run through this a little bit quickly. If you're not familiar with maybe how important this is, if you're kind of you know new to all of this. So the default or even the perceived threat of one obviously has serious negative economic impacts. Uh, the actual default would roll global financial markets and create chaos. Um, so one of the things I want to say as well is I've been I've been seeing this kind of tied in with all um, with everything going on is the, the the BRICS arrangements, right? I personally don't think that even if we do default, that BRICS will become any stronger. Um, I, I know a few weeks ago I was talking about it quite a bit. The way that I see it, though, to kind of go into it more is this: you know, it's an important economic block and something to be aware of. But these countries don't get along at all, right? So even if we do default, I don't think something like China would become more powerful or BRICS would become more powerful inherently just because of the disharmony that exists within that unit. But still, this has major implications. So uh, basically that U.S. debt, which is used as a vehicle currency all across the world, uh, would no longer be considered um, as safe as it has been. And that, that means something. Uh, the Government Accountability Office estimated that the 2011 debt ceiling standoff raised borrowing costs by a total of $1.3 billion in the fiscal year, and uh, the 2013 debt limit impasse led to additional costs over a one-year period uh, between $38 million and more than $70 million. So it just is more expensive to get from the U.S. government. Uh, if interest rates for Treasuries increase substantially, interest rates across the economy would follow, and that affects everything, obviously, from car loans to mortgages. Um, the Moody's Analytics released in early 2023, estimated that a default could have similar macroeconomic consequences to the Great Recession. A 4% gross domestic product decline, nearly 6 million jobs lost, and an unemployment rate of more than 7%. In addition, Moody's predicted a $12 trillion loss in household wealth. So obviously super important. Um, I don't know if we've ever really been in such a strong gridlock regarding this. I would like to think that our government is functional enough to get something like this passed. Uh, but we'll see what happens. Again, this is a pretty intense kind of situation, so it's something to look out for, and I would say follow uh, a bit more. Crises are still going on in the banking sector. Um, this doesn't have much to do, what I'm going to talk about right now, doesn't have much to do with um, something like what went on today with PacWest, which is a decrease in um, the accounts, but HSBC is being fined. Um, Essentially, they were manipulating um, some of their numbers. It says here, uh, units of HSBC Holdings uh, have agreed to pay $75 million to settle U.S. commodity futures, uh, charges relating uh, to manipulative and deceptive trading and record-keeping failures. Seems like that's what banks are doing today. Uh, they agreed to pay a $45 million civil penalty, penalty for manipulative and deceptive trading in connection with swaps, spoofing, and record-keeping failures. And we're going to see some more cash outflow from some of the larger banks as well. Um, before we get to that, it's important to look at PacWest. And this has much more to do with the perhaps systemic issue that exists in a lot of banks, at least in the smaller regional ones, um, which is just a uh, decrease in deposits. And PacWest today, let's see if we can pull up in a second here. Um, their shares tumbled 20% after regional banks say deposits fell 9.5% last week. And that's just last week, too. That wasn't, you know, with what happened with First Republic, obviously they lost a ton over an extended period of time, but they, they lost so much in, that, in, that, in those early days right after Silicon Valley. And we see something like PacWest that is continuing to decrease over time. Uh, the stock dropped 22.7%, further extending its recent declines. And uh, PacWest has now fallen more than 50% this month and nearly 80% for the year. Give me a second here. Pull this guy up. I mean, that's just a gnarly drop, too. You can see it did this stabilization, but again, uh, what I see is these these banks are going to continue to have issues. The larger ones will stay there because they have money and they got all that deposit inflow and rates are higher. So, so they're able to kind of withstand this stuff. These really highly like leveraged banks, um, but. I think we're still going to consider, continue to see issues. I don't know if this will 
continue to go on, and we'll have to see about that. Um, if you look in the larger scheme with more cash outflows coming from banks, what all of this does is it requires money outflow to try to like stabilize the system, right? And there is a fund for that and it gets depleted. So the US banks are gonna have to start paying way more and, and really JP Morgan I think is gonna pay quite a bit. We'll get a little bit more into that as we come back. So if you're in these smaller, you know, if you're in any regional banks at all, you know, be very cautious. I know there was a lot of like cowboy behavior with First Republic and that ended up biting a lot of people. Be, be careful with this. Uh, I, I think maybe banks is a large kind of sector are right, but smaller stay tuned. We'll be back. The Gold Report. As a precious metal, gold is still king. It continues to hold the most effective safe haven and hedging properties across the global major trading hubs of the London OTC market the U.S. futures market, and the Shanghai Gold Exchange. The Gold Report. Tom O'Brien publishes his weekly gold report every Monday morning for subscribers, consisting of coverage of the XAU, HUI, GDX, the dollar, bonds, the South African Rand, as well as 25 different mining equities with specific buy-sell recommendations. The Gold Report. New subscribers get a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. Subscribe to Tom O'Brien's Gold Report newsletter now at TFNN.com. Sharpening your skills as an investor is like getting better at playing a musical instrument. You have to practice, sure, but you also need excellent instruction from experts. At TFNN, you'll get advice and guidance from the authority in technical market analysis. And it's not just dry, tedious text either. TFNN airs live financial content streamed live on TFNN.com and TFNN's YouTube channel with Tiger TV. Live every market day from 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern for free. Each host is an experienced trader and gives their take on the market while taking calls and questions live from around the world. From the moment the market opens until the closing bell sounds, Tiger TV has eight different shows with expert hosts to help you make the right moves with your money. Watch online at TFNN.com or on TFNN's YouTube channel and become the investor you were born to be. TFNN, educating investors. TFNN has just launched their new trading room, The Tiger's Den. Hosted at Discord, TFNN has been educating traders for more than 20 years with live programming hosted by a variety of professional traders during market hours. And now they are expanding their reach with The Tiger's Den. Available to all tigers and tigresses for just $1 for the year. There's no catch or added costs when you join our community of traders. In The Tiger's Den, you can look over the shoulders of Tom O'Brien and the other TFNN hosts while they analyze charts during their live Tiger TV programs and join an interactive trading community with hundreds of members exchanging ideas. Interact with other Tigers and Tigresses as they share trading ideas, news analysis, and discuss the market action all trading day, even at night and on the weekends. The Tigers Den at Discord is accessible on mobile or tablets as well, so it's always at your reach. To sign up today and become a part of this educational community of traders, just visit the front page of TFM. This segment is brought to you by Think or Swim. For more information, just click the Think or Swim banner on the front page of TFNN.com. All right. So basically filling back up these coffers that were expended when the banking crisis just happened. Essentially what's going to happen is these larger banks are going to have to pay money back into it, right? And that takes away, obviously, from their from their profits. What's going on is something called a uh, it's called a special assessment. So it's the fee of 0.12 percent uh, to uninsured deposits of lenders in excess of five billion, and that's based on an amount of uninsured deposits a bank held at the end of 2022. If we look at JPM, like, okay, so the way that this gets spread out over the entire market itself, at least, or excuse me, in the entire sector, the large banks, so that's lenders with more than 50 billion in assets, would cover over 95% of the cost, and banks with less than 5 billion assets wouldn't pay any fee whatsoever. 
that the top 14 U.S. lenders will need to fork out an estimated $5.8 billion a year, and that obviously is going to erode earnings. J.P. Morgan is going to have to pay about $1.3 billion in annual fee, and that's followed by uh, Bank of America with $1.1 billion, and Wells Fargo will hit $898 million. Uh, so the bank index did slide a little bit on this. I, obviously, this is a lot of money that they're going to have to pay. I still think that these larger banks are okay, and they're going to be fine, and they're, they're not as, as exposed, right? And hopefully their management is a little bit better as well. Surrounding this is a heck of a lot of short selling. So there's actually federal prosecutors are looking at short selling in the bank shares. Uh, the federal prosecutors in Washington are looking into short seller activity around the recent volatility in the U.S. bank shares, sparked by the failure, obviously, of those three regional banks. Uh, their activity around the banking crisis is a, quote, area of interest for the Justice Department, which is looking for potential security market manipulation, the person said. Uh, other regulators are also assessing potential market manipulation by short sellers, uh, but the scrutiny by criminal prosecutors, which has not been previously reported, raises the stakes for potential wrongdoers. The KBW Regional Banking Index slumped 24% since the day before regulators shut down Silicon Valley Bank, and the short sellers arrange, um, obviously, to borrow shares they consider overvalued and sell them in hopes that if the price drops, they can repurchase them for less than the pocket difference. That's what that is. There has been a profit in short selling of $1.2 billion uh, during the first two days of March, and that's according to data uh, from the analytics firm Ortex. Um, so we'll see if anything comes of this. I mean, really... <laughs> It was interesting to see when, it, I'll talk about First Public because I was following it quite a bit. Usually when banks suffer like a big crisis like that and they, they get a run put on them and deposits outflow, the longer they stay alive, the better, right? And so you could make an argument, it's like, well, you know, you get calls or you, you buy a position in it because you think it's going to go higher. Um, however, I, I still think that, it, <laughs> I don't know how much manipulation exists within this, because we keep seeing massive outflows that continue to happen. We can see in larger banks that are absorbing those outflows, the immediate effects of those kind of things. We'll see if this kind of review comes up with anything. I personally don't think they're going to find anything at all. We'll see what goes on with that. In more litigation issues, uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce uh, is, is suing security regulators over the new share buyback rule, which is, this is requiring companies basically explain why they're doing this, right? Explain why the uh, corporation is buying back their shares and a more detailed issue. Um, the Chamber of Commerce said that new requirements, which SEC commissioners approved last week, will hurt public companies and their investors. Uh, the group accused the SEC of failing to properly weigh the costs and benefits of the plan or to give industry enough time to react to the proposal. Uh, the rule requires public companies share the rationale for the repurchases Details about company policies and the daily tally of buybacks on a quarterly or semi-annual basis, and it takes effect later this year. Obviously, if you're a um, larger corporation that does stock buybacks, one of the big things you can say is like, well, listen, we have a bunch of cash. Uh, there's not much you know, we want to do with this right now, so why not help our shareholders and you know, pump up our stock a little bit and kind of help them out? But you saw what happened with these wild increases and stock buybacks for the past few years is companies had so much cash because of how cheap cash was in general. And I mean, you saw such extreme highs that weren't really logical in any capacity. And I think this is kind of what the SEC is trying to get at. Obviously, we don't have an environment right now where that's going to happen again because cash is not as cheap as it used to be. But in the future, if we ever get to a point where quantitative easing becomes or at least gets back in and, and rates lower down to something even close to what was going on during quantitative easing, uh, you know, that this might prevent uh, such massive losses that we saw when everything kind of came to a halt, uh, halt. So a little bit of other news. This poor company, uh, I mean, they've already been on the, the fall, but Peloton had a massive recall. Why is this not coming up? Because I'm typing an N, that's why. I don't know how much lower this stock can go. 
they had a, a recall uh, about 2.2 million exercise bikes, and the Consumer Protections <laughs> Committee said stop using it immediately. So this is obviously horrible news. They went through, again, I mean, let's see, can we go back? We want to talk about like an extraordinarily overvalued company at $171, and then just this, this massive decrease. Uh, so anyways, in a 2.2 million exercise bike recall, um, they had received 35 reports of the seat post breaking and detaching from the original bike. Uh, that led to 13 injuries, um, obviously fractures, broken limbs. Anyways, this, uh, again, this company continues. I don't know if it has a curse on it or what, but it continues to go down. And this is at its absolute all-time low at about uh, almost $7. But I don't see an upside to this company at all. Um, they had a nice like kind of pivot when everything was going poorly for them, where they were going to start putting their Pelotons or selling them for cheaper, putting them in uh, hotels, etc. Which is an interesting idea, and I think that did show like, you know, s some competency, I suppose, um, on management's part. But I, I am very dubious to the future of Peloton, uh, so we'll see what happens with that. Something to look forward to. I know we have a lot of people who watch Oil in the Den. Um, is the we've been going through the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, and the U.S. is going to start, I think in June, start buying back uh, some of that to replace what we've uh, basically exhausted. So the U.S. administration uh, could uh, begin crude oil repurchases uh, in June, and this was congressionally mandated um, from the congressionally mandated sale uh, from the SPR. Um, and the U.S. Secretary Jennifer Granholm says that the congressionally mandated sale of 26 million barrels will be completed by June, and it's at that point where we will flip the switch and then seek to purchase. So, you know, if you want some kind of futures on oil, you're looking into getting some contracts, this is something to go around. Um, I, I'm not sure how priced in it is currently uh, after the statement came out. In October of last year, the administration announced that it would repurchase crude oil for the reserve when prices were at or below 67 to $72 a barrel. Obviously, we hit that 72 mark today. Um, the move would be dual purpose, and that not only would it replenish the depleted reserves, but it would boost demand when prices were low instead of sending them into orbit uh, at a time of regular prices. I like it. Not bad. Folks, stay tuned. We'll be right back. If you're looking for potential trading setups in the stock market, then Rocket Equities and Options Report is a newsletter you should try. Tommy O'Brien delivers options and equity trades when the markets present them using a combination of fundamentals and technicals. Sign up for Rocket Equities and Options Report today with a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. For all the details and to start your subscription today, visit the front page of TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the opening call newsletter at TFNN.com. The opening call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. Biotech is booming, but for how long? Whether you think the biotech bull has room to run or has run its course, trade LABU or LABD. Direction's daily S&P Biotech three times bull and bear ETFs. Visit directioninvestments.com slash biotech today. 
An investor should consider the investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses of the direction shares carefully before investing. The prospectus and summary prospectus contain this and other information about direction shares. To obtain a prospectus or summary prospectus, please contact direction shares at 866-476-7523. The prospectus or summary prospectus should be read carefully before investing. An investment in the funds is subject to risk, including the possible loss of principal. The funds are designed to be utilized only by sophisticated investors such as traders and active investors. Distributor Foresight Fund Services, LLC. TFNN has launched the Tiger's Den, hosted at Discord. TFNN has been educating traders for more than 20 years with live programming hosted by a variety of professional traders during market hours. The Tiger's Den, available to all tigers and tigresses for just $1 for the year. There's no catch or added costs when you join our community of traders. Sign up today and become a part of this educational community of traders. Just visit the front page of TFNN.com. This program is brought to you by Vista Gold, traded on the NYSE American and TSX under the symbol VGZ. I'm O'Brien! Alright, welcome back folks. In the interest of continuing to talk about um, some more energy, excuse me, <clears throat> uh, European natural gas prices at the sixth consecutive weekly loss. Uh, the front month futures at the TTF hub, the benchmark for Europe's gas trading, fell 3.7% to 36.80, and that's per megawatt hour. As of May 10th, storage sites across the EU were 62.48% full, uh, and lower gas prices have started to lead to increased coal to gas switching, uh, but demand nevertheless muted with low household consumption. <clears throat> Europe's benchmark gas prices have halved since the beginning of the year and are now just one-tenth of the record of over 326 uh, per megawatt hours, and that's from August 2022. And spot LNG prices for the delivery to North Asia in June have also plunged in recent weeks and were down for a third consecutive week on Friday amid weak demand and high inventories. So prices in Asia at 1050 per million British thermal units this week, and they plunged by 4.5% the previous week. Uh, according to estimates from the industry sources at Reuters. Reuters. The spot LNG prices in Asia are now at the lowest they have been since May 2021. And despite the current low natural gas demand and prices in Europe and Asia, governments and industry warn that Europe should not be complacent and that the energy crisis is not over yet, and it certainly isn't. And they need to figure out what they're going to do with Russia. I think they are, at least Germany is meeting with some people today, some other countries today, to figure out how to get themselves off of that. We might see a Germany that's running back to coal a little bit. And so we'll see what that does in the interim period, uh, especially with the environmental restrictions they have over in Europe and seeing what they're going to have to essentially kind of squeeze. This is another, you know, th this economy is just, I don't know what this slow burn is, but we have a lot of stuff going on with it. This is the U.S. corporate bankruptcy filings hit 12 years high in the first two months of 2023. So th this kind of goes on like a five to nine year cycle. You see, it's not so much due to everything that just happened. It does have to do with like interest rates increasing. But what you basically got, um, you know, about five to 10 years ago uh, with these low rates was a bunch of businesses opening up and they were cooking fine. Um, but when they now have to start paying some more uh, with the higher interest rates, they're just, they're just not built to do that, right? And this is what happens when you raise interest rates is you start just really you start shedding so much weight if you want to look at like the economy as an organism. So U.S. corporate bankruptcies are rising in 2023, uh, with the first two months of the year registering the highest total for any comparable period since 2011. Companies filed 57 bankruptcy petitions in February, while 54 were filed in January. Um, February's total was the most in a single month since, uh, that's going to be March 2021. The highest monthly bankruptcy counts in 2023 fall a historically slow year. Uh, many bankers and analysts expect a downturn in the economy in 2023, and that may prompt additional bankruptcy filings. S&P Global Ratings, meanwhile, expects an uptick in defaults for the lowest rated, rated corporate borrowers. I think that makes sense. They're not really designed to take on this much pay, essentially. Interest rates remain elevated with little reason to suspect that they will decline meaningfully 
by the year end, adding to increased costs for a time. This is super interesting to see kind of what goes on. So just year to date already, we're almost as high as we were in 2010. And we still got a, still got a bunch of other data to add into. That's year to date through February and we're in, oh man, we're in May now. Communications equipment company Avaya marked the largest corporate bankruptcy filing in February, listing both liability and assets at more than one billion. Uh, biotechnology, of course, we can see that happening quite a bit. Um, a third noteworthy filing uh, was MBG Home, and that was 676 million in, uh, in liabilities, excuse me, and 739 in assets. We'll see what happens. I think again, we're going to continue to see a lot of these kind of smaller companies. I believe I spoke about this, uh, you know, last time or a few times ago when I was on, but they're just not built. Uh, they're not equipped to be able to pay these higher interest rates. And I, I was listening to something too. Um, they were talking about the idea that uh, we, we will see a decrease in interest rates, or at least there's like a hypothesized one in December. Um, but inflation is not going away. Like it might be slowing down a little bit. And there are some like other things as well that you know, we can see like increase in joblessness claims and stuff. Um, and some kind of decrease in prices around. But if you look like uh, Michelle um, Bowman, who's the Federal Reserve governor, and she said this this morning, that if inflation remains high, which it is, and the job market remains strong, which is, more interest rate hikes would be needed. And this is a quote. It says, I, I will look for signs of consistent evidence that inflation is on a downward path when considering future rate increases and at what point we will have achieved, this, achieved a sufficiently restrictive stance for the policy rate. Um, Bowman said the latest reading on consumer prices via the Consumer Price Index and the latest employment report for April haven't convinced her that inflation is dropping. And I, I don't know if this is just like a wishful thinking type deal, right? And people have been trading a lot, uh, especially like the younger group, have been trading a lot based on this concept that rates are going to go down. I don't know. The, the headline reading for CPI clocked at 4.9% below the key level of 5%. We're still at 4.9%. Uh, but the so-called core reading, which the Fed favors because it excludes volatile food and energy prices, right, remains sticky at 5.5%. Food prices is a, is a super interesting point. Uh, I was reading something, I don't have the article up, but you have m more people uh, than in recent time and, you know, in the past few years that are using credit to buy food, right? Like, that's, that's pretty important. And the supply chains remain messed up. So, of course, I get for their metrics why they're excluding that, but that is something super important to keep in mind just for, you know, common day-to-day -day life on it. Uh, and these both remained pretty sticky at 5.5%. Um, that's in line with the core level inflation so far this year. So inflation remains much too high, uh, and this is what Bowman was saying, and measures of core inflation have remained persistently elevated with declining in unemployment and ongoing wage growth. She expects that our policy rate will need to remain sufficiently restrictive for some time to bring inflation down and create conditions that will support a sustainably strong labor market. Okay, and so one of the other things that's interesting regarding this is, we, we, I know Tommy brought it up and I brought it up as well, that we're only seeing these kind of rallies in the market due to like a handful of companies, but that's important to note, right? Like, when we talk about banks, people are keeping their money in savings. Some of these savings are returning like 4%. And what is the risk where, like, it's so risky to go ahead and put your money in the stock market when you can make a nice cool 4% on return and, and cash is going to be pretty much king in, until then. I, so, I don't know. We'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, the incentive, it needs to reverse. Um, but the problem is, is if this does reverse and we go back into the idea of lower interest rates of quantitative easing and everything flows back up, I mean, that shows another problem that the market is, is dependent on uh, something that resembles quantitative easing. And I don't know, it's been so long. It, it, we're, this is a whole new paradigm. I don't know, it'll be interesting to see. For the time being, until something like that switches, um, you know, I guess as long as there's some kind of hope or whatever, uh, among some of the younger investors that are just dumping all their money in and betting on lower interest rates, you're, you're going to get these pop-ups. But in reality, right now, the you know safest thing 
is, is going to be keeping cash and, and putting it somewhere that's paying you something like 4%. So anyways, guys, stay tuned. We'll be right back. Are you looking for a way to consistently add winning trades to your portfolio? Tom O'Brien is here to help. Tom O'Brien has been successfully trading markets for over 30 years. A frequent contributor to TD Ameritrade Network and CNBC, Tom O'Brien founded TFNN over 20 years ago to help educate investors just like you. Tom's daily market newsletter, Market Insights, is published every morning when the markets open to give you the competitive informational edge you need to succeed. These newsletters are packed full of Tom's advanced technical analysis and are geared to deliver comprehensive strategies for a successful portfolio. Get Tom O'Brien's newsletter, Market Insights, today and try all of our products and newsletters 30 days risk-free with our money-back guarantee at TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the opening call newsletter at TFNN.com. The opening call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at TFNN.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com, educating investors. Don't forget, you can listen to TFNN live on your mobile device 24 hours per day. Go to TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. That's TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. All right, folks, I, I saw an article today, and again, this is my like ongoing gripe with the, the cannabis industry as a whole. And this isn't necessarily their fault, but they paid $1.8 billion in excess taxes in 2022. I mean, this... This industry continues to get hit. And it's really interesting why they overpaid so much. And at the end of the day, the federal government always gets their, their money, right? So the cannabis companies are subject to the federal tax revision 280E. And this penalizes, I mean, this is insane to like think about it written down. It penalizes traffickers of Schedule 1 or 2 drugs by disallowing the deduction of the, quote, ordinary and necessary business expenses. Okay. So what that essentially does is uh, you're, you're paying tax, you're getting liability based on the gross income and not the net income. Uh, so that's huge and just continues to punish uh, the cannabis industries. Something I posted yesterday, if you're not hip to any of that, um, which is kind of, this is just a kind of a cool little story that they're doing with CRISPR. And uh, I think Z said something in the den about it. Um, but they've edited these to help you chill out. So if, you know, cannabis isn't your thing, you can get some of these Japanese tomatoes and they have increased levels of GABA. What I didn't realize, I mean, I knew that people were doing stuff similar, right, with CRISPR-Cas9. Uh, what I didn't realize is Japan is actually massive on this. That one, they love GABA, okay? And, and GABA's um, 
certain chemical in your brain that kind of helps you like relax a little bit, right? It lowers blood pressure. They give it to some people who have anxiety. They don't want to go on benzos or anything like that. Um, but the Japanese love GABA so much, and there's a huge kind of thing surrounding it that they actively um, genetically edit their foods uh, in order to have higher amounts of this stuff. Um, I think this is super cool in the sense that, like, w what <laughs> the, the possibilities are, I think, are limitless with this, right? Like, if there's some certain amount of something, it even happened in India, I believe, right? Um, where you had vitamin K deficiency uh, that caused blindness, and so they, they genetically edited a rice that just, like, pumped full the kids full of uh, vitamin K. And it, it eradicated the blindness. And when you do this, world economies get better, local economies get better, everyone makes more money when people are healthier. Guys, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. Tom will be back Monday.